Tim is a professor, he's a doctor, professor of mechanical and industrial engineering at Penn State. He's the co-director of the Center for Innovative Materials Processing. All of you have his background, I believe. And he's collaborated on many projects with many corporations, big and small, as we go forward. He received his PhD and, and master's degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech and his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Cornell University. He has quite a repertoire and, and background. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Tim. My goal today is sort of help you, give you sort of a little bit of background and talk about what's going on to help you sort of separate the, uh, the hype from the reality, so to speak. Uh, it's sort of been our goal. The, the models, the changes, everything is evolving so quickly. There's so many unknowns that we can't come in and tell you what the, the best solution is in terms of how to use 3D printing within uh, MRO sort of applications or this or that, because we don't really know. Heck, Boeing doesn't even know how they're going to use 3D printing or Lockheed Martin or any of these big companies. So everything is changing. Pretty much how we design, how we make, and how we qualify, and how we repair is all being redefined right now. So it's an exciting time, and it also scares the hell out of companies, too. So with that, uh, I will start. There has been a lot of hype out there. Uh, I think a lot of it gets credited to this Economist article about four years ago saying, well, within the next 10 years, we're going to go from 20% to 50% of the parts that we make are going to be made via 3D printing, final parts not just prototypes anymore, those sorts of things. And as a result, we've seen cover stories in Wired and all the popular press articles, uh, articles in Wall Street Journal, USA Today, new issues, uh, new journals that have actually started uh, in additive manufacturing specifically. There's so much energy excitement. Of course, uh, MakerBot was bought out for $450 million plus uh, not too long ago, so that, of course, creates a, a lot of excitement there as well. And, of course, we're going to 3D print in space here soon. So instead of uh, when the uh, uh, handle breaks on the uh, toilet up there in the International Space Station, we'll just pr 3D print a new one instead of waiting for the next shuttle launch. So uh, I'm not kidding. I mean, there is, uh, we're really doing this. There is actually a National Academy uh, study out there on 3D printing in space. We're just going to send them, send the machines out there, mine and harvest it off an asteroid or the moon, print our structures and go. I mean, we're not talking when, we're not talking if, we're talking when. Same thing's going on in the operating room, right? When are we going to get our new livers and, and implants? And again, we're talking with doctors, and it's not, it's not if we can do this, it's when can we do this. So it's exciting. Where this is uh, causing a lot of the excitement uh, or energy, like most folks, the uh, you know, conceptual design, prototypes, uh, inspection tooling, that's been around, uh, again, 20, 30 years. But now we're sort of operating at the high end of the value chain there, spares and repairs. Instead of having inventories of parts just sitting around. Let me just 3D print what I need when I need it and those sort of things. Integrating parts, substituting uh, for uh, production. Actually, functionality. Can I actually grade different materials in my parts to have different properties versus what I can do right now? Those capabilities exist and are moving forward. And of course, Wall Street's excited as well. The mergers and acquisitions that are going on, 3D systems, Stratasys, AutoCAD are buying people up left and right, scanning technology, uh, three, you know, different 3D printing technologies and whatnot. And you see this Credit Suisse now every year has their uh, annual report on where's the market going. Uh, this was from uh, a year and a half ago now, and every time they revise it, it's going to be way bigger than we thought it was. Well, it's even bigger than that, uh, et cetera. So because of the uh, systems, materials, you know, services and parts, again, seeing opportunities there uh, with what we can do with 3D printing. It isn't just plastics anymore. When we're talking additive, we really are talking about how do we take a, you know, a powder metal, something like that, which we'll pass around. I brought handouts here. You've got to when you're talking about 3D printing, right? Into a solid metal part like that that's going to go on your car. I will talk a little bit about the technology, uh, just so you're sort of aware of what the, the trade-offs are, more so than what the specific uh, pieces of equipment are. Because again, any one of these could be completely obsoleted tomorrow by the latest invention that's out there. So. Uh, but we do have a nice, we have, sort of have a suite of capabilities in our lab ranging from uh, different material sources. So are you starting with a powder like that's going around in that, uh, uh, in that canister? Is there a bed of powder or are you actually feeding the powder in? Or do you have a wire like in a welding system? Are you actually feeding a wire in and then melting that wire? And so the typical, the two different energy sources, laser or electron beam, you need a lot of energy to melt steel or titanium powder, right? So how are we going to be able to do that? And so we've got a nice suite of this. Gives us also a range, so not only are we looking at sort of different inputs, we also have quite a different range of size capabilities there. And so not to, uh, not to you know, test you later on what the powers and radii and, and whatnot are, but just understand that some machines are really good at really small and very accurate, and some are very good at very big. Everybody sort of thinks, oh, the, all the machines are the same, but they're not. 
And some are really good for repair, some are very good for large scale, some are very good for small scale. And sort of, again, that's sort of a common misconception that, hey, they're all the same, I just got to buy one and pick it. They're all radically different in terms of what they can do. And the value proposition and the business case you need to make for each one of these types of technologies is very different as well. The Optimec, I think this is probably one of the most relevant uh, sort of processes. This is called a directed energy system. And so what's going on here, unlike the laser in the powder bed, you are now you're turning on the laser, creating a melt pole, and literally blowing powder into that and capturing it. And you move it back and forth and back and forth, retract, and the laser goes up, repeat, repeat, repeat. And so again, you can build up a particular part. So now we're building this particular plate. One of the cool things about this is I can change the metal, the alloy, on the fly. So I actually have two different powder feeders. And so I can change the, the alloy as it's going. I can grade it from one material to the next. I can have a hard material here. I can have a soft material there. I can have a corrosion resistant material there. Whatever I'd like to do. So you now have that capability. And because it's a directed energy process, you can also, you have a lot more flexibility for repair and restoration. So the uh, tool, uh, the tool bit that I passed around there, restored on, repaired on this sort of machine. Put it in a chuck, spin it around at the right rate, deposit material. Rotocraft shaft, $6,000 part. Repair and refurbish for about $500, about 10 cents on the dollar. Get these back in operation, so I'll pass this around. This is probably the heaviest of them all, so be careful. But essentially, you're depositing material here and here. This is where the bearings are, and they, wind that, or they grind that down, right? Well, let's just deposit material, deposit material, and then machine it back down so it's in spec. You know, I'm good to go. So again, $500, $600 on a $6,000 part. And what's the time to do that? Uh, that's a, the, the, do the repair on that maybe uh, three, four, five hours. I mean, it's half a day, probably. Probably the setup and everything is longer than it actually takes to deposit that. And that's, again, one of the advantages. This, uh, this little nozzle with this particular system, you're trading off speed and accuracy. So this nozzle I can actually print in 20 minutes on that system. This in the powder bed, this would take probably eight or nine hours. So it's a little bit rougher, not as good tolerance. Again, these are the trade-offs. So all the systems that you're dealing with right now, speed versus accuracy, just like milling and you know, the other processes. So fundamentally, the trade-offs are the same. But understanding, all right, well, it's the powder and the laser energy and those sort of things that, that all impact that. Okay. All righty, good. Sayaki then, last system. Actually, this is the, the big dog. This is uh, welding on steroids, I call it. Uh, you can actually print a, um, let me show this. There's a picture of me inside of it, actually. Three feet by two feet by two feet parts on this. And so it has an electron beam, huge electron gun that's coming down. Titanium wire is then being fed in here. Here is the rails where you insert the build plate, and then you actually build on top of that. And it's built in a vacuum chamber, and that's me standing inside the vacuum chamber. They literally had to take the walls off the, the building, the windows off the building, be able to get this in. I was hoping once it got in, they'd never be able to take it out, but somebody paid enough money, and they took it out last week. So uh, the almighty dollar won on that one. Um, but anyway, this sort of allows you know, Lockheed Martin, among others, looking at this technology, you know, this is a picture from almost 20 years ago now when stereolithography first came out, the idea of let's just print a wing. With their big system up in Chicago, it's 20 feet by 8 feet by 8 feet. You can print a wing. Now, it's a lot of warping and you need some machining afterwards, but the technology is there now to be able to do that. And so they're actually producing components that are now flying and uh, being certified on uh, the Joint Strike Fighter and other aircraft that uh, using uh, technology just like this. So here's one of the things. I talked about the economics, right? Half of the build time was to create those supports to make sure they're built successfully, and two-thirds of the cost was in those supports. And so because we don't have good tools right now to tell us how to design for these processes to make sure they're anchored down well in the overhangs and fillets and all that, all that knowledge we sort of take for granted with milling and casting and forging, all of that is sort of being created right now. And the companies that are creating it aren't necessarily sharing it because they feel that that's given them a competitive advantage. And so that's one of the challenges. We recognize that, but at the same time, how do we, particularly at a university, how do we try and uh, collect as much of that knowledge that, and share with everybody as we can? Because those lessons learned, the more we can share them, the quicker uh, sort of uh, all floats or, or all boats will rise with the tide there. So. so there are a lot of advantages for additive. I've shown you some of those. I'll give you a couple more examples here, uh, and then we'll open it up for some questions. 
Um, obviously, being able to run you know, small lot sizes. You know, we don't need special purpose tooling. Give me the CAD the 3D file, I'll set it up and, and print it. We're good to go. The ability to customize your parts. So very low, you know, small lot sizes, being able to do customization. A lot of the early work was in uh, dental, medical uh, implants, particularly over in Europe. Uh, Invisalign braces now, for instance, is all custom braces that are 3D printed uh, for you. So there's, there's whole businesses now out there based on this. Quick turnaround time. I think this is really where you have a big opportunity from an MRO perspective is you're not necessarily going to make it lighter or less expensive, but you're going to make it quicker because you're not having to wait for the tooling, you're not having to wait for this, you're not having to wait for that. It is going to change the dynamics from a send me the file, print it, and I'm good to go. And we've seen anywhere from a you know, 5x, 10x significant uh, speed up there in terms of that. You've got a lot of flexibility as you're designing new parts, lightweighting components, we talked about that, those sort of things. The buy to fly ratio, so how much, how much material you're buying versus uh, and machining away versus how much is actually on uh, the aircraft itself. So here was one example of the, the lead time improvement. NASA is, is investing a lot in this. Uh, essentially, uh, this particular part, this baffle, welded and assembled together, nine to 10 months. With this process, nine days. So we've gone from nine months to nine days because of this. So think what that allows you to do in terms of prototyping, getting your designs ready, getting parts out there, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this can go in all sorts of different ways. Uh, significant time and cost savings. So plus, it's better because we're not having to rely on all these individual wells, so it's a more structurally sound part. So it's even performing better, and you're able to get it out there quicker. GE, if anybody's been following, they are the, the poster child in terms of uh, uh, additive manufacturing. The Leap uh, engines, these nozzles, 18 the, the previous design was 18 different components. Now they're printing it as one single part. 25% lighter, uh, it performs better, et cetera. Now the challenge, though, they need 100,000 of these in like the next five years. There aren't enough machines out there right now to print that many, let alone the supply chain, let alone the powder, let alone the training and the operators, let alone everything else. So they are making significant investments trying to build up that supply chain. Well, that's on the sort of the forward. What about when the repair and maintenance and those sort of side? You gotta, that's all going to be, uh, you know, this is going to follow that as well. They actually, though, were able to just get the, um, I don't know, two weeks ago now, the GE has the first FAA-approved 3D printed part to fly on an aircraft. First one ever. So the FAA has finally cleared it. They're working on about another dozen components for the LEAP engine. They've got $135 billion in inventory or orders waiting to be made for this technology. So this is a huge, huge uh, game changer for them. I think they're planning to invest about $3.5 billion in the next five years to make sure and make this a reality. We, you know, when was the last time anybody was talking about investing those kind of dollars in, in a manufacturing technology and you know, its implications? So that's, that's pretty exciting stuff. So exciting opportunities there. So coming back to the end, repair, refurbishment. I already mentioned the uh, repair opportunities there with those couple of things. And you're already seeing this in the military as well, the logistics side of things. And so uh, uh, the mobile parts hospital, if you're not familiar with this, you can, can Google and check that out. They sort of rethought, you know, sort of rethinking logistics. You're out in Iraq or a, a war zone, wherever the case may be. Something breaks, something doesn't work. You're not going to wait around for them to ship that part and get it out there. You want the, the ability to be able to fix it, repair it, uh, get up as, as quickly as you can. So, so basically they figured out, here's an eight-foot eight, eight standard, eight by eight by 20 shipping container, completely outfitted with machines, software, computers, satellite link-ups, uh, compressed air, the ability to level it so that they can get those parts repaired and refurbished or made new as quickly as possible, get them deployed and keep, uh, keep the officers uh, up and running. Over six years, they made 100,000 parts, and the next version they're talking about is going to have some of this 3D metal printing capability. So in that case, it becomes a, an, an asset that helps you get to the end quicker in terms of that. It's not redefining the logistics or anything of it, but it's going to become another tool in the arsenal that's going to help you get net shape parts and move very quickly. And then the, uh, the rapid equipping force. Um, is this some of the LMI work that you guys had done there? Uh, looking at what sort of technology do we need in these, uh, these expeditionary labs. So again, the shipping container idea. If we're going to drop that down, what 3D printers and other tools do we want to be able to have there? And I think one of the key things here is they recognize who are the personnel that are going to be running this? 
Okay? And so, yeah, we need a combat soldier, so we got somebody who's out there. What are the needs? What are the repairs? What are the things that aren't working well? You got a couple of engineers. I guess you can guess who the engineers are in the picture, right? <laughs> and then, you know, we can guess who the special forces operator is as well, right? <laughs> So you've got the deep field expertise, you can got, you got the, you know, the, the customer interface, and then you got the guys in the back that are doing this. And it's so the team plus the tech that makes this happen, right? And so these are now getting out there and getting fielded and seeing some good results for them as well. So the opportunity, of course, the Navy, not to be left out, has said uh, Admiral Dunaway, I think initially 2017, I think he's given him a few extra years, basically said we're going to have 3D printers on aircraft carriers uh, to be able to just, you know, instead of carrying around all these parts, we got powder, we got a machine, we're going to print them and go. Not all as easy as a, as a MakerBot per se, but, uh, you know, you need a special tool. You do have a floating factory on these, you know, things, parts, where you got mills, lays, etc. Again, you're going to add a 3D printer. There's going to be another tool in the arsenal there to be able to help that and be able to print the fleet. And, of course, the, you know, I mentioned the CT scanner. Challenges right now with uh, what are the IP and copyright issues here? Because I can scan any of these parts. Now I got a point cloud. I can print that. Who's going to stop it? There's no way the file doesn't contain any of that information. So what does that mean? You're now MakerBot sells a you know a digitizer for 800 bucks. I can scan a part and print it. So now how do we? Are we going to design parts that can't be reverse engineered? What does that look like? Well, what are the CAD tools to do that? How are you going to do that? Or how do we use that? So I mean, a big question. We're doing some work with uh, you know logistics right now and, and repair. If you don't have uh, the technical data package and you need to repair that part, where are you going to get that information? We'll go to this. And then if we avoid that, what does that mean or not? So again, you're sort of redefining all of this. And uh, I just had to put this up here because I love the title of that article. It'll be awesome if we don't screw it up, written by Michael Weinberg, a lawyer. Uh, one of many that's checking this out now in terms of what's going on with intellectual property in 3D printing. So. So in terms of other, uh, you know, faster parts, bigger parts, how do we print metal and plastic together so that it creates a, a functional part? These are all some of the, the, the questions that are being asked right now. We're also looking at how do we use this for new ways of innovation. And so one of the things that GE did was partner with uh, GrabCAD. So now you can, GrabCAD is a repository of, of online uh, 3D models. So uh, if anybody's heard of Thingiverse is another, uh, you can actually go online and download any part that's out there. So uh, that's pretty cool. So we, they partnered with GrabCAD, and they had an open innovation challenge. They said, here's our bracket that holds our, uh, it's, it's an engine test stand. This is our current bracket. We've machined this away out of a, a block of uh, aluminum or whatever it was, and it currently weighs about four and a half pounds. This is obviously the plastic version, so it's a lot lighter than that. But uh, here's the loading condition. Here's the bolt pattern. Give us a better design. And so they open it up, crowdsource that. And within about three months, they had 700 people submit designs. They then took the best uh, designs, sort of screened them, picked the best 10, gave each one of them $1,000. Not too bad, right? Then they printed those out, out of metal, tested them, and then they gave the winner $10,000. You'll see, unfortunately, there's no US in the top 10 there. <laughs> okay, our, de our design wasn't picked. Any guesses on which one was the winner? The red one? How much is just the look of it influencing you or not, right? <laughs> okay. Bone, you know? I mean, that's, that's a good looking picture there. I don't know whether it's a good bracket or not, but all right. Indonesia. Gentleman right there, barely 18, 19 years old. He and his brother had hired, uh, started DTEC engineering over in Indonesia. They're $10,000 richer, and apparently GE has hired him as well now. So not a bad, not a bad gig. So his part, 84% lighter than the original one. And so this goes to this buy-to-fly ratio. GE buys 10 pounds, machines away 6, and flies 4.5. No, we're just going to print it and not even print a full pound of material. So the weight savings, the time savings, the energy savings, huge opportunities here for this. We're doing some work similarly now with uh, uh, space applications, $10,000 per pound to fly a you know, pound up in space. So if they could save four or five pounds, that's $50,000 right there that they've saved. And that's you know, one component out of the hundreds or thousands that are on a rocket or whatever the case may be. So everybody sees this as an opportunity as competing because it's going to disrupt things, right? 
digital inventories. I don't need to carry parts around. I'm just going to you know, shoot my data and print it out. So now who owns the digital rights? How do we copyright and protect that? What does that mean? That becomes a huge, from this sort of enterprise-wide thinking about this, that is going to be the key. What are the systems for that? How do you control that? How do you manage that? Is going to be uh, what sort of makes or break this. So now, print them on demand locally. You've got local hubs. You're taking the shipping and the transportation out of the equation because I'm just going to beam you the digital file. I'm going to print it there, and we're going to go. And so it's changing the economics of everything. It's changing the economics on the production side, and I think it's going to change the, product, the economics on the MRO side as well. When do you repair and refurbish, and what do you or not based on this technology? So, so it's an exciting time. There are some great resources. Again, point you if you're not familiar with America Makes. A uh, great group, great opportunity. Their website, americamakes.us. There's a workforce group. There's a technology group. There's all sorts of activities, and, and they keep a good list of, of, of everything that's going on in this space. And then I'll also point you, if you're back up at Penn State or ever want to come through uh, and tour the lab, uh, sim3d.org uh, is our website. We've hosted several technology exchanges. Uh, we you know, bring in the supply chain folks when they're there, whoever. Uh, I'm the co-director with Rich Marticanitz over in ARL. If you have any Navy uh, or, or DOD connections, uh, see some opportunities there. And then my colleague, uh, Gary Messing, on the material science side, specializes in ceramics and other exotic materials. So he's going to be pushing us in that direction in addition to the metal. So, so it's an exciting time. There's a lot of opportunity. And uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you.